Hey there, my name is AJ Pickett and I make videos about role-playing games and lots of them. I live stream every weekend and upload every week. You can also find me on Subscribestar, Patreon and Discord, Facebook and Twitter. Also, there's an option to join the channel as a member and I welcome any questions you have in the comment section below. As always, if you like this video or this channel, hit that like button if you would be so kind and subscribe. One of the most iconic evil gods in the Dungeons and Dragons lore, easily recognisable and yet complex and mysterious. Both a demon lord and a goddess, the queen of the demon web pits, the supreme goddess of the drow. Today we're going to be delving deep into the lore of Loth. Well, in order to really understand Loth, I have to start with a fair chunk of lore on the elves and the lore of the elves, so bear with me. It's very and very important to keep in mind that religion, mythology, politics and upheavals are what shape the gods. It is a very rare thing that the actions of divine figures are what cause the upheaval in the worlds where they are worshipped. Gods are astral life forms, the astral plane and outer planes within it are dimensions of thought and belief. The Feywild and Dream Realm border the astral, and we can clearly see that story and fable are as fundamental to these realms as gravity and electromagnetism are to the primaterial plane. Gods are also pan-dimensional beings, so there is the general concept of Lolf, and there is the Lolf of Greyhawk, the Loth of Ebron, the Loth of Faerun, they're one and the same, but they're also shaped with many different constraints and facets which are imparted into them by the faith of their followers there. If everyone believes that Loth has a strong aversion to wasps, then that is exactly what Loth has. She has some control over this, Loth has a lot of control over this. It's one of the main reasons gods spend so much of their efforts supporting and communicating with their clergy that can cast spells granted by Loth and are drawn from those who are receptive to Loth's visions and the signs she creates for them to lead them in the right direction. One of the very best ways to get a god's undivided attention is to somehow cause a massive change in the general perception of that deity among the mortals. Usually this can only be accomplished by other gods, who have such an ability to reach thousands and thousands of mortals all at once, delivering powerful visions, signs, portents and dreams. A prime example of this occurred in the Elven Pantheon. If you listen to what the surface elves believe, they call it the banishment of Loth. The drow elves, who refer to the surface elves as fairy elves, have a very different view of this and regard the banishment story as blasphemous lies and heresy. I'll talk more about their vision of Loth later on. So which is true? Well, the answer is, we cannot find the truth within the world setting itself. We find the truth in the real world literature and the creative writing of Gary Gygax, Elaine Cunningham, Ed Greenwood, Eric L. Boyd, R. L. Salvatore, David C. Sutherland, Jeff Grubb, Dave Cook, Monty Cook, Bruce Cordell, and many others who have built this amazing fictional figure for us over the decades. It is by putting together their contributions that we work out the intended story of Loth. If you ask an elf, a dwarf, a centaur, and a chitain who Loth was and where she came from, you would get four very different answers. In an upcoming video after these next few, I'll be delving deep into the lore of the elven people, their origins and their history, culture and activities. So I'll not talk about the origin of the elves so much, or what the Fey world was like back in the earliest days of the Dungeons and Dragons multiverse. Also, while the first tales of Loth are revealed to us for the Greyhawk world setting, first, the bulk of the subsequent lore comes to us from the Forgotten Realm setting, and that will be my main focus throughout this video. It's actually a few contradictions from other world settings that cause the most confusion. If you forget that, the different worlds have slightly different Lolths, so I needed to point that out. So the writers tell us that Lolth was once a member of the early elven pantheon, in the time before the drow came to exist, in a time when many elves on the surface worlds worshipped the Feywild, fairy lords, not the elven Seldarene pantheon. On the world of Toril, this takes us back over 30,000 years before the current Dale Reckoning calendar even begins, to the time called the War of the Seldarene, and the role of a solar angel called Melchizedek, now known as the Branded King. Seldrin means Fellowship of Brothers and Sisters of the Wood in Elven. It is a term the elves use in place of Pantheon. Usually, in the early years of the Elven gods, they lived within Arvindor, a realm within the first layer of the outer plane of Arborea, which includes Olympus, and they refer to Olympus as their home plane. Arvindor is a vast, infinite expanse of pristine wilderness covered in lush forests with many stupendously large trees broken by massive mountains, perfectly clear streams, placid lakes, and an ocean called the Sparkling Sea. The sea acts as a planar boundary on one side of the realm, while the mountains become a dense range of snow-capped peaks that forms the outer reaches in the opposite direction. 
It's a place of unearthly beauty full of wonders and secrets, both peaceful and wild. Serene, but with a touch of nature's savagery, though without any evil behind it. It is, in short, the heaven of the elves, and unlike many other mortal races, it is also their original homeland. I'll skip over a big chunk of text I wrote here about the early history of the elves and include that in a future video. Instead, let's look at the events that transpired in Arvindor, which led to the transformation and genesis of Lolth. Surface elven religious history tells us that she seduced the Solar, who was in close service to Coralin, named Melchizedek, and used him in her plot to murder Coralin, but the lore on this specifically is probably next to non-existent in the records found on Toril. Something clearly happened that caused the Solar to be branded on the head by Coralin and banished into the lower plains and the Nine Hells forever. And it seems to me that the Solar got a really raw deal. As a result, he absolutely loathes every elf in existence and wants them all dead. Reading the story of Arushni, you can see this point of view. Arushni is not merely a consort of Coralin. They were the parents of the twin deities, firstborn Bavarin and secondborn Elastrei. All of the following lore is taken mostly from the Elaine Cunningham's novel Evermeet Island of the Elves, which is essentially a collection of lore gathered by one Danilo Than, a bard and ex-lord of Waterdeep, sixth son of Ramus and Cassandra of the House of Than, and former Harper agent, husband of their Everescan half-elven assassin and Harper, Aralyn Moonblade, who had a deep desire to learn of her elven heritage. Her future spouse Danilo, while the Harper, was sent by his uncle Calvin Blackstaff Aronson to spy on Ireland and protect her in the year 1361 DR. The collection of lore that Danilo published six years later was very much motivated by the desire for knowledge of elven history which burned in the heart of the woman he came to love. I should mention that the two of them did spend time in Everesca and Waterdeep and also Candlekeep during this time researching Ireland's magical moonblade. Anyway, here is what he discovered. At some point, Arushni grew ambitious and started to plot against Coralin. Perhaps it was just a bid for power, perhaps it was jealousy over how close he was getting to her rival Sahini Moonbow. Who knows? Prior to taking Arushni as a consort, Coralin was both male and female, but settled on male for the most part from that point on. During Arushni's first attempt, she aided Grumsh, god of the orcs, in trying to kill her husband by imbuing the very scabbard that she had crafted out of webbing that also webbed in pro uh, him in protective magic and housed his enchanted sword so that it would instead cause his mighty sword Sahandrian to shatter during the fight with Grimsh when he struck it with an ordinary rusty iron hand axe. This was the same combat that resulted in Grimsh losing his eye to one of the strikes from Sahandrian. After Sehanin appeared with the weapon suddenly remade as good as new. It makes a lot of sense that the two researching magic swords of the elves would begin with this tale. The goddess Sianine Moonbow is a constant thorn in Arushni's side and her chief rival, discovering and foiling all of her plots. She discovered the tampering with the scabbard because Arushni wove and performed the act of sabotage during the night, which is the portfolio of Sahinin, and she could see everything that took place during that time. During the night time and moonrise, Sahinin grows greatly in power. Switching tactics, Arushni slipped out of the domain of the gods, stealing her daughter Elastrae's wondrous cloak and boots of elvenkind, and took on the avatar form to descend to the prime material plane, following a thread of unusually strong magic she found herself on one of its worlds, the world of Toril. Toril at that time was ruled by dragons, and the weave of magic there was very strong, drawing other supernatural beings, including many gods, to it like moths to a flame. And so Arushni searched for a god both savage and yet malleable enough to replace her failed alliance with Grumsh. One-eyed Grumsh was done with alliances with any elf. They were nothing but his immortal enemies now and forever. Moving to the center of the supercontinent on Toril, she found the heart of a massive and ancient forest and some mountains there which had primitive orcs gathered to witness some battle between titanic combatants on the peaks above. Slipping past them, she found the god Mela standing over the fading remains of another savage god like himself, and drawing her daughter's enchanted bow, she took aim and then advanced and hailed him. As is the way of gods, Arushni knew Mela, Mela knew her, and Arushni also recognized the fading corpse of the orc god Hearn, whom Mela had just killed. Showering Mela with flattery, Arushni made a ploy to appeal to the ego of Mela and his hunting prowess, explaining that no greater challenge existed than to hunt and kill Coralin himself. 
Mallar was sorely tempted, but wanted to know why Arashni did not just kill the weakened Coralin himself, returning from his battle with Grumch. And her answer says a lot about the strict and very fey code of conduct the elven gods adhered to. She said, I would, except that the other gods of the Seldrine love Coralin. They would not accept as their ruler anyone who killed him, and I wish to rule. Still, Mallar did not see what he was going to gain as a god until Arashni informed him that the mighty Grimsh had not only failed to kill Coralin, but had been blinded by him. So if Mallar killed Coralin, all the orcs who worshipped whatever god was strongest would flock to Mallar, and he would become a greater god since there were so many orcs on so many worlds. Also, Arashni offered one last prize, the elves she said she would send to this world once she ruled that Malar's orc worshippers could hunt and kill to their heart's content, even though Malar pointed out that there were elves on the world already, because where the magic is strongest, there are always elves. Anyway, being served up fresh elves on a platter was a delicious idea, and now Malar, Lord of the Beasts and the Hunt, was her next pawn in her plot to kill Coralon. Arashni was confused by Malar's claim that elves were on the world already, as she could not sense them, so I suspect that the elves she spoke of were actually the immortal fae beings called the Lachey, who were on Toril at the time before their first elves arrived. Arushni had sent Malar through a planar portal directly to Arvindor, where the Beast Lord attacked the already wounded Coralin. This infuriated Coralin. At least Grumsh was a greater god, Malar was a minor god who scavenged for worshippers across a hundred worlds. How dare he even enter the home of the elves? How dare he attack Coralin? Yet the battle was not one-sided, as you would think, and it was only Coralin's speed and eventually having to throw his sword and strike Mallard right between the eyes that won Coralin the battle. Two great battles in one day, although a day in Olympus is quite a long time. Two losses, and Arushni slipped back into Arvindor in a foul mood. Returning the hunting garb to her daughter Illustrae, she noted once more how tall and beautiful she was. Also, how her silver eyes reminded her of Sehanin's own eyes. Arushni didn't care for competition from any other being, not even her own daughter, so the idea entered her mind of turning Illustrahi into her scapegoat in a future ploy. I know this sounds ridiculously mean girl behaviour, but remember, the reality of existence for the gods is that popularity is worship, worship is power, and power is life for the gods. Arushni's next plan was much more complex, and she took on a more formidable and predatory form as her avatar that she could travel to many different strange and dire places, seeking out allies in the battle which would soon to come. Because she knew Coralyn would figure out the cause of the two serious attempts on his existence in just one day. Assuming the form of a giant spider, she travelled from world to world, talking to the gods of orcs and ogres, goblinoids and evil dragons, and as the sun set on Olympus, she returned to Arvindor only to find Sehenin waiting for her in her own home, accusing her of treason and conspiring with orc gods, holding the very scabbard that Arushni had crafted for Coralin with its perfect weaving and powerful enchantments. Arushni accused Sehenin of knowing about the scabbard before the fight with Grumsh, making her an accomplice through her inaction. Frustrated that the moon goddess had unraveled her plan so easily, and knowing that at sunset, she was not at her full power yet. Arushni struck out with magic and ensnared Sayanin in her webs, trapping her. Summoning her son Varun, who knew of the upcoming battle but was shocked his mother had attacked Sayanin so soon, after all, Sayanin is one of the most powerful of the Seldrine, he worried and wondered why Arushni didn't just kill her, to which the goddess replied, it's one thing to destroy a god from another place in another pantheon. Even among gods, there are hunters and hunted, predators and prey. But to kill a member of one's own pantheon is another matter. If it were so easy, would I not already rule Arvindor? And her son replied perhaps she should just leave the Seldrine and attack the pantheon openly at the head of an army, rather than all this dishonorable sneaking around and treachery. But Arushni knew that would never work, for her allies were too powerful in their own right to simply be led by her. They included Maglugliet, god of goblins, Hrugek, god of the bugbears, Kutulmak, god of kobolds, Oril, goddess of the winter, and many others even more powerful than those. No, that was not an option. Such an alliance would never survive past its immediate goal of Coralin's death. They only had one option now, for Varun to take Sehenin to a place where the moon doesn't shine, and to place Coralin's enchanted scabbard in a place where Illustrae would find it just beyond the border of Arvindor, where traditionally she would go hunting every morning. 
When Varen opened a portal and left with the captured goddess, Arashni wondered just how much she could trust a son so eager to murder his father, and with this came a moment of clarity for her. Now her hated rival Sahinin was out of her sight. And I'll quote directly this neck part because it sums it up so well. For the first time, Arashni realized how truly alone she was on the path she had chosen. With this realization came a moment of regret, but the emotion did not linger. And when it passed, something else went with it. A part of Arashni's heart that had been slowly dying, unnoticed and unmourned. The slender thread of magic that connected her to the other gods of the Seldrin and to her elven children had finally snapped. Whatever else Arashni had become, she was no longer truly elven. Arashni would either rule the Seldrin, or she would rule somewhere else. And so Arvindor was invaded by a host of more than a hundred enemy gods. The Fey gods, allies of the Seldrin, flocked to the Great Forest as well, and the battle was intense. Corallin knew that a traitor stood in the midst of his own pantheon, but didn't know who it was yet. Sayanin was suspected, but because she, she was not present, Arashni was at a safe distance, casting magic with Faerun at her back, protecting her. Their daughter Illustre had warned the Seldrin of the invading army and fought well. It was a hard fight. Many gods died on both sides. But it was not until the very end that Coralyn was in the most danger, because of the one ally Arashni found who waited until the right moment to strike. The battle done, Coralyn put his sword back in the treasured sheath made to him by his beloved consort returned to him by his daughter, where the blade became stuck held firmly by the enchanted weave, and at that moment, a horridly evil green slime bubbled up from under his feet and trapped him, causing an ogre god to come charging at him at the opportunity. The bubbling slime was the ancient god Gonadour. Startled, Corallin glanced toward the place where Arashni stood. The naked triumph on her face chilled him as even the cloud of Melar or the creeping horror of Gonadour could not do. Before he could absorb this shocking understanding, Illustre's shriek tore his gaze from Arashni's gloating face. Coralyn glanced up at his daughter, loosing an arrow that took the attacking ogre through the throat, felling it. But she had loosed a volley of arrows. Some hit the ogre, but the enchanted weave of Arashni's scabbard altered the flight of the last arrow, causing it to veer off target and strike Coralyn instead. Coralyn knew without a doubt why his sword had shattered and why the arrow now struck him. The pain of Arashni's treachery swept through him in great crushing waves. Coralyn did not even feel his daughter's arrow plunge into his chest. To the other Seldrin, it looked like Illustre he tried to kill her own father. She was struck down by the goddess of the air, Aedri Fenya, who had just returned from her victory and banishment of Oril. The Seldrin and Arushni raced to Coralyn's side. Gonadar now vanished again without trace. Arushni told them that he was dead, for her daughter never missed her mark. But that was not true. Coralyn still lived. The arrow was intended for an ogre, not an elf, and the black arrow's broad tip had failed to get between Coralyn's ribs, saving his life. As the other gods started to chant and lend their power to Coralyn to heal him, Arushni had only one desperate option left. She produced a vial of liquid, telling others that it was the blessed waters from the plain of Elysium, infused with healing herbs from the heart of Arvindor itself. In truth, it was poison, not so deadly as to kill a god immediately, but potent enough to keep him in a slumber, perhaps even kill him if he received many doses over time. Again, Arashni planned to pin the blame on Illustrei if the potion's real nature were to be revealed, saying that her daughter gathered the herbs, not her, which was actually true, but of course Illustrei had intended the poison to be used by her mortal followers against their own enemies, not her father. But at that moment, unexpectedly, Sehanin returned and blasted the vial of poison from Arushni's hand. What happened next was the confrontation of Arushni and the further unexpected arrival of a new goddess, the combined essence of Sehanin Moonbow, Adrifania, and Hanali Selenil, became the goddess Angharad, who became the new consort of Coralyn and queen of Arvindor. She healed Coralyn and then it seems reformed back into different parts, what followed was the accusations of the gods and the banishment of Varen and Arushni. Illustrei decided to join her brother in his banishment, with the hope that she could redeem him so that they could return to Arvindor. And Coralyn told Varen that if he ever harmed his sister, it would be the last action of his life. As for Arushni, Coralyn asked why she had betrayed him, when he could have given her anything she asked for, and her answer was this. Exactly. You would have given. 
True power is not given, but seized. As for your great gifts, I held in my hands the destiny of mortal beings. But was my own ever mine to command? You treated me like some cherished and cosseted possession, while standing the way of everything I desired. And then, after their children had departed, Corlin rose to his feet, faced his con- former consort and said, Arashni, your sentence has been spoken by the Seldrine. For what you have done, for what you have become, you are declared Tanari. Be what you are, and go where you must. And her elven form was stripped from her, transforming her into a monstrous spider, with her elven head remaining, but all trace of kindness removed from its visage, now twisted in hatred. Corlin and Arashni then fought each other, without interference by the other gathered Seldarine. They watched in horror as all traces of elven beauty left Arashni during the fight and she fully became the monstrous spider. It was a one-sided battle, of course. Arashni was badly wounded by Corlin and retreated to dangle from the web, taunting him to kill her or he would never be free of her. She screamed that he could not do it because he was weak. Corlin hurled his sword at her, trusting in the sword's own judgment rather than his own, but it sliced through the web she was hanging from and she dropped. But instead of hitting the ground of Avendor, because she was already banished, she plunged through a dark portal below her, down into the abyss, shrieking curses and vengeance on all the Seldrine as she fell. Corlin knew that this was not the end of his troubles, it was merely the beginning. What follows is no longer the story of Arashni, it is the story of the demon lord Lolf and her arrival in the abyss. So I will switch over to Eric L. Boyd's Demi-Human Deities published in 1998 and relate the lore that is included there. As a new abyssal lord, Arishni assumed the name Lolth and set about securing as much power as she could within the abyss, which it turns out is quite considerable. We should continue this tale with the rise and power of Lolth, her eventual return to godhood, her enlistment of the Baylor lord Wendanai, the descent of the drow, the origin of Phaserous energy in the Underdark of Toril, and other drow gods of the Dark Seldarine, and details on the faith and clergy of Lolth. But for now, please hit the like button if you made it this far. Subscribe if you like what I do. Check out my subscribe start or Patreon links for all those full scripts for these videos. Buy some Teespring merchandise. We're your geek with pride and as always. Thanks for listening. And I'll be back with more for you very soon.